right. Well, as it's a bit usual for me, I love hearing God's voice in the time leading up to speaking. And so he's given me a couple of um, more specific words to just release before I get going today. So this might be for you in the room. God hasn't pointed out exactly who it's for, but someone here or even online, and it might be for multiple people. So I'll just um, get going on those. So the first one is for someone, and you have been financially robbed. You've been in a situation, and it looks like if you were a quarry, the excavators came in in broad daylight, and they just took and they took. And it was like you were had your um, hands and you're pinned against the wall just watching this excavation of your finances happen and there was nothing that you could do about it. Um, and so the Lord wants you to know the word for you is restore and that he's going to restore you financially and he's going to restore you financially many fold. Like even maybe up to 10 times fold, he's going to restore you financially. And he wants you to know, don't be worried that this happened in broad daylight. Don't be worried that you had to sit there and watch it happen and it felt like the whole world watched it happen because what that means is your restoration is going to happen just as publicly. And so that will be the testimony of what um, he's doing and that restoration will be much greater. Um, and then the other word I had specifically was someone has a little fledgling business and it's floundering. It's like a little floundering, I can't even say that. It's a little floundering, fledgling business. <laughs> Got it out. It's floundering. And so you're wondering, is this just a pipe dream? Like, what am I doing? And God's saying that the, it's an issue of submission. And so if you just bring this little fledgling before the Lord and choose to submit it under him and be willing to take on a strategy that you actually didn't want to do, then the dream that you have will come to life. And hey, we're in a restoration season. I don't know if you knew that. So that word restoration, that's for all of us. So you might even want to take that just now for you as a general thing and go, I'm in a restoration season. Thank you, Jesus. And take that on. All righty. Well, let's jump into to more of the message. And I am going to dive in quick. If you know me well, I'm not great with the whole introduction thing. I just like to like, let's just go straight to the point. And some of you here get a bit uncomfortable because you're like, you're just so heavy so quick. But so I'm, that's my intro for you, just then. <laughs> so, like, let's just look. We have to look at reality to get going. Like, God's got an incredible word for us. It's wonderful. And if you want it, you can have it. But we actually have to look at reality first to be able to go with God to that. Um, and so, like, there's been a lot going on, hasn't there? A lot of you have had stuff coming one after another like this, but some of you have had it coming like uh, 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 all from different angles all at once. And like I've even found myself saying like you just couldn't make this stuff up. Like we couldn't dream this. Like it couldn't even get in a movie because we wouldn't come up with it. And several weeks ago our son came to us and um, he was really pale and really weak and we immediately knew something is really extremely wrong. And it resulted in a trip to emergency. This was a thing just completely out of the blue. There was no history for this. And he's okay. He's okay, praise God. So, all good. But it really was serious. And if you looked at the year, it was just like, this was another thing. Like another out of the blue thing. Like, are you serious that this happened? And a few days later, I was spending time with the Lord. And I just felt like he said to me, Deb, do you want a protection upgrade? And I was like, uh, yes, I do. Um, and he's like, there's more protection available for you, you know. And I'm like, I am in. Now, for those who are parents in the room, you will know that if God wants to get your attention, he will go through your kids because I've had stuff going on all year, in honesty. But when it's my own child that comes, I'm like, okay, not up for this. So God knew to ask me that question at that point. 
Now, some of you here are feeling like you're just getting hit by all sides, one thing after another, and you'd actually like to get somewhere, you know? Like, you'd actually be like, I'd love to actually just do something purposeful, something good, and go somewhere, but it's taking all you can just to remain standing up, and you're like, I'm just surviving by dealing with the onslaught. I can just survive. Others here, you've been a Christian for a really long time, but you're in this waiting zone. You're just like when am I going to enter into this more that I keep hearing about? And it's waiting so long that you're starting to languish and thinking, am I ever going to get there? Am I going to go there? And even perhaps you're starting to think, do I even want to go there? Because the passion's dying out and starting to feel like I'm just going to survive here. But then there's another group here and you've actually gone to that place. This is as good as it gets. There's no more. And hey, I'm alive. I'm not dead yet. You hear people say that, right? I'm alive. I'm still alive. As though, you know, it's all good. And on one level, it's good to accept that reality, but there's a resignation in this that, like, there isn't anything better. And so I'm just going to survive through life. But God wants you to know there's more available and that you can thrive. You don't have to just survive. There's more, and you were actually made for the more. So think about for a moment what happens when a child is adopted by their parents. Just think about that for a moment. The the parents come along and they offer to parent the child, and the child accepts and receives them as their parents. It's beautiful. But it doesn't stop there, does it? When a child's adopted by their parents, they go with the parents and they actually move into the parents' house. And so they move into a new home and this becomes their home. They go and they live there. So I've got a photo here of my first ever house that Toby and I had. This is our first house that we ever bought. Um, So we are pretty fond of this house being the first one. And believe it or not, like you'll notice that, you know, the fence doesn't match the house and the paint's peeling off. This is major upgrade version of this house. This is like two-thirds of the way through the renovation. So we were like feeling really good about it at this point. This is our first house. Then we upgraded. So I've got another photo. Um, Yeah. We upgraded to our next house and this is where we brought home Hannah and Joe from the hospital into our family home. And this is actually on the day that we were leaving that house. So we've been packing all day. And Eli's in this photo. He's inside. (laughs) And um, so I was about four and a half months pregnant then. And we really just couldn't fit him in this house. So we we were moving to a new house to receive him into. So just think about a family home for a minute. And what's in a family home? In a house. There's a front door that you go through. There's a living area. There's a kitchen. There's the bedrooms, a bathroom, laundry space. And the people who all live together in that house, they tend to do similar things. They're not actually that exciting things, but they they get sleep and they have rest there. They eat there so that they're nourished. They go to the toilet, the shower, and they clean themselves. These are the things that happen in a family home. They spend time doing simple things. And I used to be an OT a long time ago, and we called these activities of daily living. We called them ADLs. These are things that you need to do, and you just do them several times a day. Going to the toilet, getting dressed, make a cup of tea, get something to eat. Now, in that home, what else happens? People often have really important discussions. They might thrash out a problem and solve it. The parent might teach the child explicitly how to do something, share wisdom. But if you think about a -a 24-hour day and a young child in a home, there's not that much conversation in that day relative to all the other things that happen in the house. Most of what the child learns is just by absorbing 
what's going on. They're absorbing the way their parents react and respond. They're absorbing the environment that they're now living in. They're using the things that are in the house, aren't they? So when we become a Christian, it's a bit similar. God comes to us. He's offering to be our Lord and Saviour. He's offering to be our Father God, and we say, yes. And so we then talk about it like, oh, now we have Jesus in our heart because we've received him in. And it's wonderful, isn't it? We've got him in there. We are assured of our salvation for heaven. And so we also have that beautiful thing of no one can ever take that from our heart. But there's more than that. We're now surviving because we've got salvation for eternity. We're now surviving. But the Lord is pointing out that we then get to go into his family and enter in and we get to go and move into his home into his house, where we live and we are surrounded by everything of who he is, the way he is, and everything that he has. So God showed me that the reason we're not thriving is because we don't know our God-given inheritance. So inheritance is what we think of when someone dies and they give you some money or they give you some furniture after they're dead. Well, Jesus has already died. So when we're talking about the family of God, Jesus has died. And so the inheritance we're talking about with him is already available. But have we inherited it? So the word inherit means to receive it. We actually see it and then we take it. And we have a lot on offer from God, but we might not have received it for various reasons. Maybe we don't know we're allowed to receive it. Maybe we don't know it's okay to access it now. And we might not even realise that it's there. So it's a bit like going to your bank account and there's a million dollars in there. Ooh. For some of us, though, we don't go to our bank account very often and look at it, do we? So we might not even realise there's a million dollars of inheritance that's gone in. Others, we do access the bank account, but then we see it and we think, this would never happen to me. I would never have this happen to me. And so we think, it can't be right. It's too much for me. It's too good, so I'm not going to use it. And we leave it sit there. But when a child moves into a house, it's actually in that context of love an encouragement of nurturing that the child realises that they are safe and they have permission to explore and they check out what's going on in that house and then they might realise they're actually allowed to use it as well. Now, you might know this firsthand because you might have come from a family life where it was cold and distant And so you might have experienced that you knew, don't cross lines. Don't cross those barriers. Don't assume good and don't assume that you're allowed to look around and access anything. Don't borrow dad's golf clubs and take them out for a whirl. Don't take mum's shoes to wear out to that party. You're not allowed. So you might have experienced that. Now, I have a food vice. A lot of people are rapidly learning this so I'll just tell everybody I have a food vice and it's chips and in our house everybody knows which chips are mum's chips it's very clear (laughs) everybody knows that mum needs a certain amount of them (laughs) but one of my kids will come up to me and he will simultaneously kiss me on the head I think he's very, like, grinning while he does this. Kiss me on the head and he puts his hand straight down that packet simultaneously and he exits with a big handful of chips. And a bit of me is like, um, these are mine and you know that I need the whole packet. <laughs> and I know there's other parents here who have this too. But deep down, I'm actually really relieved because I'm realising he knows he's loved And he's comfortable to come and access his inheritance of chips from me. (laughs) So let's look at it from a different angle. 
Last week, Jeff touched on this with the prodigal son in the Bible in Luke 15. We're going to touch on it now personally. So the story of the prodigal son, there's a family, the youngest son takes his inheritance, he runs away, he wrecks it, smashes it and comes back with nothing, hoping he can just move back into home. The father responds so beautifully and extravagantly, so glad to have his son back and then there's the older brother. Now, the younger son took his inheritance, didn't he? Did he? Did he? He took the money. He ran off with it, but he didn't know what to do with it. And he ran off. So his understanding of his inheritance was far from, inc- far from complete. He didn't know what to do with the bit that he did know of. And he was missing out on the rest of it. So maybe you can relate. You've thought, yeah, I know what God gives me. And you've taken it, you've grabbed it, and you've run off to use it. And then, whoop, that didn't work. You've run off to use it, and yet it's just full and dead. You felt barren and thought, this is not the plan. You didn't really know what you were doing with the bit that you understood and you didn't understand just how much there was. The older brother, though, when the younger brother comes back, the older brother was jealous. He was jealous. When he saw his father give such extravagant blessing and love, he was jealous. Do you relate to that? Do you have feelings sometimes of thinking, what's all this extravagant talk of God? Like, why would he do that? There's no need for that. There's no reason for that. He wouldn't do that. It's not necessary. And I'm fine as I am. I'm surviving. I've got enough. Sure, it might be just enough, but I'm surviving. But then secretly, when you see it poured out on someone, there's this twinge of jealousy Or maybe even a private scoff on the way home. Then that's ridiculous. Why would God do that? Because you're actually trying to cover up, I wish that happened to me. And the reality is God can only give who he is. And he is full, complete, perfect love. And so his love for us and for you and for me is going to be extravagant. That's who he is. It's not based on how much you think you need. It's based on how wonderful and huge he is as your father. So do you relate to this? When you see someone else blessed, do you relate to that feeling of jealousy? Now, the older brother, he's actually, like, if we think about this concept of home that he should move in and live with his family. It's actually like he was living on the footpath of his home. It's like he's living unsheltered. It's like he'd just get bare scraps for food. He'd never get brand new clothes. He'd get hand-me-downs from someone that totally didn't suit him. He'd have nowhere to get changed. He'd have no cover when the darkness comes. He's on the footpath. And yet at the same time, he's saying, I'm fine. I'm surviving. I'm fine. He might have been waiting on the footpath for the invitation into the house, not realising he's a son and the invitation happened long, long ago. So the older brother didn't accept his inheritance that was being offered to him. He didn't realise he was allowed to run and have it that it was already offered. Interestingly, he would have had knowledge about what to do with his inheritance because he wouldn't have run off like the younger brother and blown it. He would have actually known what to do with that money. So it's not an issue of what do I do. It's an issue of I'm allowed. So where do you sit? Have you tried to run off with the things of God only to end up barren and it hasn't worked? Have you lived not realising all this stuff I know about is for me now? Or are you like me thinking, there has to be more. 
but I don't know how to get it. So to go well in life, to be protected and thriving, we need to do the inheriting of our inheritance. We need to inherit our inheritance. To live as you were created. This is living as you were created. This is what you're designed for. In the family of God, as his child, you can have your inheritance. But you can't receive it if you don't know it. So we're going to jump into another passage which will be a little bit surprising. But come with me into Ephesians 6. And it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honour your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Then we skip down several verses and now we're in the armour of God. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armour, your inheritance of God, so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armour of God, your inheritance, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, that's your inheritance, the breastplate of righteousness in place, your inheritance, with your feet fitted ready, with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, your inheritance. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, which you can use to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, your inheritance. So your inheritance is the armour of God. Now, this passage begins by talking about family. Life going well in family. Talks about honour, that life goes well, so it will go well. Honour is seeing the good available and receiving and taking that good available and using it. Honour is not just saying, Toby's a great husband. Honour is saying, he's a great husband, and then I receive the benefits and the goodness of what that means for my life. That's honour. So for those feeling anxious about honouring your parents, honour is taking the good. It's not taking the bad under God. You let God show you the goodness that's available and honour is receiving that goodness from your parents and taking it and using it. So what's the good available to us in this context with the Lord today? It's your inheritance. It's the armour of God. So we'll only see this good if we are allowed to explore and discover it in the house of God. When we feel safe to do that. How do we feel safe? When we enter into that loving, nurturing family of God. So you'll notice that armour is what you put on. So it's like getting dressed. And some of you here are waiting, going, I just want to be ready to go into the mall. When am I going to be ready? Ready, ready, ready. But you haven't got dressed yet. And God, in his protective fathering care, often doesn't let us enter in something naked. He gets us dressed. He gets us ready. So he's very good to us. In the context of a house, this means that we get our armour on doing the activities of daily living, in the resting in God where we sleep, in being loved by God where we know him as a father, being nurtured by God where we eat in the house, being cleansed by God, we have a shower, sleeping, relationship, eating, they're all activities of daily living, but we have that version with God in his house. 
And so we're just doing the everyday things with the Lord over and over again. And we're immersing in this environment that he provides and learning from that. So we can't be that younger brother that that just grabs it and runs away. That's not going to work. God wants more for us than that. That father wanted to give that younger brother so much more than some money. So much more. And many of us think, well, I've got the armour. You know, I know what the breastplate of righteousness is. I know what the shield of faith is. Uh, There's more. So much more, right? Like we know that as we enter in with God, he's so profound that that, those concepts, there's just always more, more and more. So that means when the thoughts come against my mind like a plague, I can know, no, I've got a helmet of salvation. I'm saved. So whatever these thoughts are doing to make me threaten that I'm not safe and saved, that's not true. I'm saved. I know this helmet and it's on. When God gives us a directive word with peace, we're talking about the shoes and the armour here. His word with peace. When he puts those shoes on you, that means you're ready. You are ready. You don't put your shoes on. Just think about getting dressed and you're in your house. You don't put your shoes on to go and have a nap. And you don't put your shoes on to go and watch a movie. You put your shoes on when you're about to go out the door and do that thing. So what happens is God says his shoes are like a word of direction with his peace on it. And when you get that word with his peace on it, that means I'm ready. Now just note, peace doesn't mean excitement. Sometimes we get confused. We think, whoa, it's so exciting. I'm going to get to do this thing. So off we run. That's not peace. Peace is that sober sense of this is right. And isn't that an amazing inheritance that we get a directive word of the Lord with his peace on it when we go to do the daunting thing. We enter into our daunting thing with his peace that steadies us. That's his armour. Now when betrayal comes, and this is for someone here, you've had accusations come against you thick and fast. Your heart's really hurting You can know that you're not a bad person. Those words are not true. You don't have to stay forever in grief because you have the Lord's breastplate of righteousness on you that says, you are made righteous in me and he says he's covering you, he's holding your heart as you go through that grief and he's also going to make sure that he's guarding your heart for that process. Now, what about when sickness comes for the third time? Maybe I should upgrade that. Seventh time this season. That's been a thing, hey? Instead of saying, oh, I'm sick again, la, la, la. Oh, well, here we go again. I'm alive. I'm not dead yet. We might wield the sword that says in Jesus' name, no. But we might also hold out the shield that says, I have faith that God is here. He's covering me through this and there is healing available. So it is a process to realising what's available and receiving our inheritance. We don't just go, boop, I've got my inheritance now, great. How do we move into God's house and receive what he's offering us? So the first thing is, realise now that there is just so much more with God. That's the first thing. So just take a moment now and imagine your dream home. And yes, it can be something that you would never, ever be able to have. What is your dream home? Just let yourself come up with a picture in your mind of what your dream home would look like. Now just imagine that this home was God's house and because you're his child, you lived there. Just imagine that for a bit. 
you have this incredible bed that means that you sleep right through the night in a deep sleep every single night. You have amazing food, and this could only happen with God, amazing food that you consider amazing and you're really healthy and nourished from it at the same time. (laughs) Chips would become like the most nourishing food ever. And you have a perfect, kind, loving father who is always available for you in that house. I wonder what else would be in your house. Just realise that there is so much more with God for you. Even if you've had a long history with the Lord and you've experienced many wonderful things, there is so much more. Now, another way to move into God's house and receive your inheritance is a word that we don't like to use. It's meditation. Meditate. This is biblical. That we are to take the Lord's words and really sit with them and think about them. And think about whether what this actually means for my life. And we don't do that very much. So that means that you sit with what God's saying to us. You're letting the profound nature of what that means expand and go in deeper. So you might want to read the word about some of these concepts, the armour of God, being adopted by God in Galatians 5. There's many verses around living in God's house, being God's child. Sit with that. Now, another form of meditation, this is the next point, is to move and immerse yourself into the story. So if you're a visual person, this works really well. You take the parable of the prodigal son and you imagine that you are a brother in that story. And you just let the story be read out to you and watch it unfold and then see your reaction. Very quickly we come up against going, oh, I'm not quite as comfortable with all this as I thought I was. That's really good because then we can pray through and realise where our barriers are, where we're struggling. You could picture yourself in that house you just imagined. Picture yourself with your bags going to the front door and opening that door and trying to go into that house. And some of us, I think, would struggle to even go through the door. You could picture yourself going through and seeing your bedroom that has your name on it. No one else is going to use that room. It's just for you because God the Father is your father. So he's given you a room whether you're on the footpath or not. It's there. Picture yourself going into that room. And again, as the barriers come up, talk to God about it. Pray about it. And the last thing is regularly go back to the basics. It is the seeming basic and mundane things that equip us as people. It's the activities of daily living that equip us. Don't diss the ordinary things. In all honesty, there's been a lot of dissing by Christians. Like, yeah, yeah, I know God loves me. Yeah, I know he's good. I know he's good. Don't diss these things. We need these things like air. They are activities of daily living for a reason. If you're married, you know that if your spouse was loving to you one time, you're not now good for the rest of your life with them. That's not going to get you through. Don't diss the simple things with God. God loves you, that God cares for you, that he is kind every time that he has your best interests at heart. These things take time. It's a process. But there's more and we can move into thriving. So you were made as God's child. You were adopted by him. That means you get to move into his family. You're made to live in there and receive the inheritance from him. You're made not just to survive, but you are made to thrive. Will you enter into the more?
Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that there is more. We thank you, Lord, that we get to have you as a father and you're incredible. We thank you, Lord, that even from this end of because there's always more, there's always more to discover and explore. And so life with you is not dull. It's not boring. There's wonderful things to check out with you, God. So I pray, Lord, for people on all different spaces, those that don't realise they can access more, Lord. We pray that they would come into knowing that they can. And those, Lord, who have no idea what to do with their inheritance, God, we pray, Lord, that you'd help them learn, help them see, God. We pray for you to become our Father more and more. And for us to just enter into your house, help us, Lord, to go in there and realise it's extravagant, but you made us for that extravagant love of yours. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.